Thank you, Karen. Your timing is impeccable, by the way. I don't know if you guys noticed that. She finishes right when that timer hits zero. We're dealing with a professional up here. Uh, a couple of quick, real quick housekeeping things. Uh, as we did last week, or more accurately, didn't do, we will not be passing the offering plates. If you have an offering that you need to drop off, they will be, the plates will be at the exits on your way out. You can drop them off there. Remember, if you leave the sanctuary this morning to use the bathroom, get a drink of water, change your oil, when you come back, please use hand sanitizer again on your way back in. Uh, parents, uh, if you're here with small children and you need to step out for a little while and you don't want to miss the service, we have some rooms set up for you in the children's area uh, with TVs that are live streaming the service so you won't miss anything. And for those of you who are watching at home, if you have any questions about us and what we do here at Gate City Baptist Church, you can check out, check out our website at gatecitybaptist.org, not .com, .org. Now, does anybody know what today is? Flag Day. Flag Day is, that's June 14th. It's the day we commemorate the Stars and Stripes being adopted as our national flag. Now, in the past three months, we've missed a lot of days to celebrate. We missed St. Patrick's Day, Earth Day, National Teacher's Day, National Nurse's Day, Mother's Day, Happy Mother's Day, by the way, uh, and Armed Forces Day. We also missed our annual community Easter egg hunt. I have a big bin of eggs in my office. I'm still trying to figure out what to do with them. And I'm betting some of you have bags of eggs that you took home to fill and bring back. If you want to bring them back, go ahead and bring them back. I'm, we'll find a use for them. Um, and while all of those are certainly worth occasions worth celebrating, um, we missed one that's more, that's worth celebrating all the time. And that's Easter, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. And even though the date on the calendar says that Easter was two months ago, there's no expiration date for celebrating our risen Lord. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house, to worship you, and to celebrate all the great things you've done in our lives. Today we celebrate the resurrection of your son who overcame death and sin for us. Thank you for his sacrifice and for the eternal difference it's made in our lives. We dedicate this time of praise and worship to you, and it's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Dan. With this being Easter, we are going to start with a responsive reading. Now, I've been in these kind of churches forever and know what a responsive reading is, but not everybody here may know what that is. So let me tell you, it's very simple. There will be two sets of things to read. There will be one for me and one for everybody else. There's an example. I, I will be the leader. You will be all. So please stand and join us as we do a responsive reading. Christ is risen. He is risen Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Thank you, God. He gives us the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed.
wondering what I'm doing, I had to get my steps in, so thank you for, uh, for waiting with me. What a wonderful day, isn't it? We can celebrate the risen Christ every single day, but today we're setting aside, as Dan said earlier, just, just to worship Him, that He arose, and because of that we can have life and life eternal. It's my favorite day of the year. I don't care if it's in June, May, March. Easter is special. So we go with me right now to the Lord in prayer and just thank Him that because He lives, we can live too. Father, thank You for Your love. Lord, we're able to love You, to worship You because You first loved us. And Lord, You didn't just say You loved us. You demonstrated Your own love for us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So Father, thank you for sending your Son. Jesus, thank you for willingly coming and laying down your life. And Holy Spirit, we're in awe of your power of raising Jesus from the dead. And we are so thankful that you live in us too, that right now you're empowering us to worship you, the living God. So Lord, move in us. Lord, give us attentive ears to hear Pastor Michael's message today. And Lord, may we not leave this place the same because Lord, you are living and you are active in us. So thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we continue to sing. Thank you. 
When I was, uh, it was the summer after I had finished seventh grade, uh, at that point, and of course, school was a bit different uh, in the sense that uh, middle school did not, or junior high does not start until seventh grade, and how our church worked is that after the, the, the summer, after your seventh grade year, that was your first opportunity to be able to go with the youth to summer camp, and so I remember uh, vividly my first experience being able to go on one of those trips, and I know this is kind of surprising, but I wasn't a particularly cool seventh grader. And nothing about me was particularly cool at all. I mean, how I carried myself, how I dressed, nothing about me was cool at all. But I remember distinctly on that trip that, that early on in the week, I discovered something for the first time. I would begin to share a story, and I noticed that not just people my age, but people uh, 
middle schoolers, high schoolers, adults, they would listen to my stories and then they would laugh. And I thought that, that, that feels really good. Uh, we even had a, there was a senior, his name was Ben, and Ben, at, at that point, because um, not only did I not look cool, I was also chunky, like really chunky. And so at that point, he started to call me Slim. And I don't know if he was doing it to actually harass me or just to, to just joke with me or not, but he started to call me Slim. And I, it didn't bother me, but the, the youth minister came to me and he said, listen, he said, I, I've heard him saying that to you, and if that bothers you at all, I will stop it yesterday. He said, "So, because uh, I'm not going to have people made to feel uncomfortable. I said, no, it doesn't bother me at all. And so what would happen is the week would unfold is that people would say things like, hey, Slim, tell us another story about your grandmother. And I'm like, okay. And so from that point on, for years, I wasn't Michael, I was Slim. Uh, and somehow even uh, as people, some, some of them even at school began to call me that. Certainly at church I was nothing but slim. Even going on into college and the seminary, there were stacks of people that that's all they knew me for was slim. If I go back to my home church today, I, I went back, uh, back in the fall to, to speak. And people that were there back then, they say, hey Slim, how are you doing? And that, that, for years that was my nickname. Now let me ask you this. With respect to nicknames, we tend to be okay if someone gets a nickname that someone else gives them. We tend not to like them so much, or we don't respond to them as well when they are self-designated. For example, if I were to come up to you this morning and say, if, if we've never met, and say, hello, my name is Michael, but you can call me Einstein, you would be like, um, really? How about I just call you Pompous? How about that? Let's see, let's see how that one works. We tend to be okay with nicknames if they are not self-designated. We tend to not like them when people give, when people give themselves their own nickname. Now, I want you to think with me today as we're, we're giving thought and intentional focus to the resurrection of Jesus. It is a big deal, and we want to make a big deal about it because it changes everything. You take the resurrection of Jesus out of the Christian faith, you don't have anything to believe in. Uh, there is nothing that gives us hope. It's that big of a deal. But I want us to think about the resurrection of Jesus through a nickname, through a title that was not given to Jesus, but one that he gave himself. And what was the title? You see it with me in John chapter 11. If you would join me there today, John chapter 11. We're going to look at two verses, but I want you to keep your Bible open because we're going to be looking at some broader context. John chapter 11, starting with verse 25. Just so that you have some sense of context, if you're, if you're familiar, this has to do with the resurrection of Lazarus. And Jesus says to Lazarus' Lazarus's sister, Martha, in verse 25, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Pay attention again to verse 25. Jesus gives himself a name. I am the resurrection and the life. Well, let's think more broadly about what's going on and then kind of unpack what's going on. If you were to go back to the beginning of this chapter, you discover that Jesus is going, traveling throughout Galilee, doing the work of his public ministry. It's getting later in his three-year public ministry, but somewhere along the way, he has met a group of siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It seems, it, based on context, that maybe they all, the three of them, live together. But Jesus has befriended them. They've established what seems to be a pretty close relationship. But he can't stay with them. He's got work that needs to be accomplished. So he's traveling about, and Lazarus gets sick, and he becomes critically ill. In fact, he becomes so ill that they wind up sending a message to Jesus through a messenger. Hey, Jesus, the one you love is sick. Lazarus is really sick. Now, they send that message. Why? Well, the same reason that Caroline might say to me, hey, Michael, the coffee's not made. Because you expect something is going to happen. They send that message to Jesus that Lazarus is sick because they expect Jesus to drop everything and come and do something about it. But Jesus doesn't. In fact, he stays where he is for a couple of more days. And then he announces to the disciples, we're going to go see Lazarus. But as he does so, he communicates and tells his disciples, hey, I'm, Lazarus is dead and I'm going to raise him. I'm going to wake him up. 
So Jesus, God the Son, knows the condition of Lazarus. He didn't get another messenger saying, oh, by the way, he's gotten worse. No, Lazarus has actually passed. Jesus knows that Lazarus is dead. And so by the time he gets to Bethany, where these siblings lived, Lazarus has died and been buried now four days. Lazarus' body is in a tomb, stone covering it, four days now. And so when Jesus arrives, there is this discussion that takes place. And Martha, according to verse 20, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she doesn't wait until he gets to the house. She runs out to meet him, and she says this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, you could praise her because that's communicating that she believes that Jesus has some sort of power, some significant power, but also she's kind of berating Jesus because she's like, hey, you're here, thanks, but it's too late. You're four days late. And Jesus says to her in verse 23, he says, your brother will rise again. And she, she hears that, and Martha's response is, I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Which is, in effect, to say, yeah, I, I think somehow at the end of time, somehow all of this is going to shake out, and somehow he's going to be able to, uh, to come out of the grave at some point. But, you know, that's, that's far later now. That's not right here. That's not right now and hearing that Jesus that's all the context that leads us back to our focal passage where he says in verse 25 I am the resurrection and the life my guess is if you have been to enough stores or talked to enough customer service reps on the phone uh, over time you have had a conversation something like this you have some sort of difficulty with a product a service or something and you're talking to an individual and finally you say I'm sorry but I need to speak to a manager right? You'll say that because you get to a point where you realize, I need to talk to someone who could actually do something. Now, when Martha says to Jesus, hey, I believe that somehow, some way, at the end of time, all of this is going to settle out, it's at that point that Jesus responds, and when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, in effect, Jesus is saying, I am the manager, you're thinking about getting this taken care of in some way at the end of time. I'm telling you right here, right now, this is something that I am able to take care of. In fact, he is suggesting by assigning himself that title that resurrection and life are so implicitly and inextricably linked to him that he can give himself the title resurrection and the life. But... Notice what, that's not all that Jesus says. He says, I'm the res resurrection and life, and then the one who believes in me, got that, even if he dies, will live, but everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. You read that and you say, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you die, you live, but if you believe in me, you don't die. Uh, what, what exactly does that mean? I think it has everything to do with the title that Jesus gives himself. What you might even say is a nickname, he, that he is the resurrection and the life. The word that is used there that's translated as resurrection is, is a word that literally means to raise up or a raising up. Sometimes it was a word used to describe, for example, if you're in a chair in a seated position and when you go from up from that seated position, that is a raising up. So it, it might be used in that sense. It is also used when you have someone who is in a grave and is raised up from the grave. It's pretty clear based on context, that's what is being described here. And he, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the raising up one. I'm the one who can take care of this. Now, if you are familiar with what is going on in this passage, you know what is getting ready to happen. If you've never read this story, my encouragement for you, go back and read the 11th chapter of John. But what is getting ready to occur is that Jesus asks to be taken to where Lazarus' body has been placed in a tomb, and then he tells them to remove the stone and utters three words in verse 43, Lazarus come out or Lazarus come forth and this guy that had been dead his body wrapped in grave cloths for four days all of a sudden is not dead anymore this guy who had been placed in the grave walks out of a tomb 
Why? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the raising up one. Now let me lead you to think about this for a moment. How ecstatic would people have been? I mean, you got Mary and Martha, in fact, in, in this passage, as Jesus gets to the home, there are still people there that are trying to comfort them and trying to just love on them and to love them through these early stages of grief. But now they have gone from absolute despondency to absolute ecstasy. I mean, they are so amazingly ecstatic. But the excitement of Mary and Martha pales by comparison to the excitement that Lazarus would have experienced, right? Lazarus has gone in, in a moment from dead guy to not dead guy. That's really big. I mean, I, I've experienced some mood changes before, but nothing like that, right? He has gone from being in the grave to now Lazarus is not in the grave. He is living again. Well, that's really good. It's amazing. But why did it happen? Because Jesus is the raising up one. People were ecstatic. Lazarus was ecstatic. I don't know how much longer it was, though. Maybe it was months. Maybe it was years. Maybe it was decades. But at some point, Lazarus became Haynes Lineberry's favorite customer. Because Lazarus had a second funeral. At some point in the future, Lazarus died again. At some point in the future, his body was wrapped in burial cloths and placed again, maybe even in the same tomb where they had to scratch out the old date and put the new date. But Lazarus died again. But wait a minute, I thought Jesus was the resurrection. He is, and Jesus raised him up. But thankfully, Jesus didn't stop when he was assigning himself titles. He didn't just say, I'm the raising up one. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. In the end, Lazarus needed more than a resurrection. What he needed was the second half of the title. He needed life. You know, at some point, everyone in this room has lost someone that is dear to you. And maybe as it was approaching, and, and, and maybe with, because of a, a terminal diagnosis, you were praying that God might do something. And even after your loved one had breathed their last, if somehow God had miraculously stepped in and, and given them life again, at some point, at some point in the future, the heart would have stopped. The lungs would have stopped. They would have died again. Even if we experience a raising up, even if Lazarus experienced a raising up, he needed something else. What did he need? He needed the resurrection and the life. What is the life? I think you get a sense of it by paying attention to that statement at the end of verse 25 where he says, the one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who believe, lives and believes in me will never die. I, I think what you're beginning to, to discover is that when Jesus uses the word life there and talks about living, he's not just talking about experiencing more chronological experience or time here. He's talking about something of a completely different quality. He's talking about life that does not end. He's talking about eternal life. Lazarus experienced a raising up but that, that didn't solve the ultimate need because eventually he was going to have a second funeral. At some point, I'm going to be checking out of this, this world. My time, your time, is going to come to an end. And what I'm going to need, what you and what everyone is going to need, is not simply a raising up. What we need is to deal ultimately with the problem so it never happens again. I need life that does not end. And Jesus says, I am the guy. I am, you want to talk to the manager, I, you are talking to the one who can take care of this. I am the resurrection and I am the life. I am so synonymous with it. I so have the power to make this happen that my name even, the moniker I can give to myself, is synonymous with it. But that's what Lazarus needed. He needed not just a raising up, he needed life that didn't end. 
I've been experiencing something as I go to the grocery store lately that perhaps has been a challenge to you. If I am going and trying to pick up, for example, some things over in the produce section, let's say I need a couple of cucumbers or maybe some tomatoes or something like that, I'll go pick out what I need, and then I go to get one of those plastic bag things to put it in. All right, so I go and grab those, but if, remember, they're folded like this, so you kind of unfold it, but then I need to, well, first of all, figure out which end opens. Do you realize you can't open those things with dry fingers? All right, so here I am. I'm at Walmart. I'm at the grocery store, wherever I am, and I've got this bag. I'm like, how do I get into this? Because this is what I want to do, but I've got coronavirus all over my hands. And so I'm, I'm like, what do I do? And I start looking around. I'm looking for something over in the produce section that sweats, right? So I'm, uh, f- maybe did, is there some uh, refrigerated uh, salad dressing? Is there some, maybe have the sprinklers just come on? Maybe, is there some broccoli or something over here? This way? I'm, I'm going to try to find this so that I can get this thing open. And finally, I, I get it open. And invariably what will happen is, because I'll go to the, to the grocery store with a list, and I'll get back to the back of the store, and I'll realize, oh, no, I forgot to get, I forgot to get cucumbers i got to go back up there, and what do I need? I need wet fingers again, right? My problem hasn't ultimately been dealt with. When Lazarus experienced a raising up, his ultimate problem wasn't dealt with. And so the amazing thing is that Jesus said to Martha, he said, I am the resurrection, I'm the raising up one, and I'm the life. That I can make it such that, and I have the power such that life does not in. You know, at the outset, I talked about um, being given a nickname, and it's okay if we're given one. It's a little more problematic when we assign ourselves a name. Jesus said on that day, I'm the resurrection and the life, and perhaps, and we're not told, but you can imagine that maybe there were some who overheard this conversation and thought, what is, what is Jesus talking about? Who in the world is he thinking he's a resurrection? I thought that, this is Jesus of Nazareth. This is good teacher. This is compassionate guy. This is uh, uh, this is miracle worker. But like the resurrection and life. I mean, that's like me calling myself Einstein. Who does Jesus think he is until the third day? And then at that point, Jesus demonstrated that he not only in, in the life of Lazarus, but in himself, has the ability to raise up. But not just raise up. Not to experience simply a raising up, but then to experience a life that does not end. Then at that point, the thought is, oh, maybe the title fits. Now, the, the Summer Olympics were supposed to happen this year, but with everything that's going on with the coronavirus, that's been postponed. But because of previous Olympics, the name uh, Usain Bolt, or Usain Bolt is a name that you're perhaps familiar with. He's uh, an Oli- uh, Olympic sprinter from Jamaica and uh, is just amazing to watch. I don't know if you've ever watched him, th- this guy race, but his nickname is Lightning Bolt. And if he gave himself, I don't really know where that na- nickname came from, but he gave, if he gave himself the nickname Lightning Bolt, maybe initially there were other runners that thought, <laughs> who does he think he is? Where does he get off called Lightning Bolt? Yeah until he becomes the fastest runner in the world, the fastest sprinter in the world. And then you're like, well, if the shoe fits, if the name fits. And maybe on that day when Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and life, maybe there was a part of her that thought, really, who does Jesus, and maybe she would have never voiced it, but who does he think that he is? Maybe others thought, who in the world does Jesus think that he is? I am the resurrection and the life until the third day. And then the thought is, oh, oh, he has the power to do this even for himself. That means that he has the power also to do this for me. That resurrection and life. And I'm going to need both that they can be found in him. After Jesus said this to Martha... He doesn't stop there. He finishes with a question. He says, Martha, do you believe this? It's a really important question. Martha, do you believe this? We didn't look at it, but here is Martha's response. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. 
And we can read that and say, man, look at Martha. She is, I mean, this is somebody who's got her faith act together. This is somebody who's got this whole concept of Jesus. Everything is in the box. Just Everything is aligned properly just as it should be. This is somebody who has it. In fact, if Martha were around with us, we would have taken that confession and we would have patted her on the back and we'd say, Martha, you've got this. Let's baptize you. Let's make you and celebrate you as a member of God's family and part of the local fellowship. We would say, you've got it. Until what happens in the passage. Jesus gets to the tomb of Lazarus and he says to roll the stone away. And What does Martha do? She says, don't do that. He's been in the grave for four days and he stinks. What does that mean? Maybe Martha didn't believe it like she said. She was saying the right things, but maybe belief is not really where it needed to be. Let me just say to you what Jesus said to Martha on that day, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the raising up one. He's the one that gives life, eternal do you believe this do you really believe this will you bow your heads with me I ask that very simply again do you really believe this how can you tell I think there's a couple of ways. One is that the Spirit of God will show you in your heart. You'll feel something, either affirmation or conviction. And maybe right now, and my hope and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit is saying to you where exactly you are. And whether you are in this room or you're someone who's watching online, when Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life, do you believe this? Do, do you believe this? Really believe it. If not, for those of you that are here, as soon as this service is over, will you stop me? I'll be at the rear lobby. Will you say, hey, I need to talk to you for just a moment? Will you find Jamie and say, I need, just, I need to talk to you? If you're watching online, will you call us? Say, I, I need some help thinking through these things. Something's not right inside, and I want to get this settled. If you've already made that decision, maybe the fright and the fear of everything that's been going on, maybe it is that how that you've responded indicates that maybe your confidence in Jesus is not what it should have been, and that your prayer needs to be what the demon-possessed boy's father said to Jesus. I believe, but help my unbelief. There's belief there to be sure, but it needs to grow. Lord, will you help it to grow? Will you pray with me? Father, for not just assigning yourself a title, but for backing it up with action, that you are the resurrection and the life. That these things are so stemming from your ability that you are synonymous with the very act. We're grateful because everyone in this room, everyone in this world, we're going to experience a need for this. A need that can only be met in Jesus. And it all hinges on ultimately whether it is that we believe or not. For those, Lord, who need to make the decision to cross the threshold of faith and to begin a relationship with you, I pray that you will motivate them to do that and to seek from us, from, uh, from others, from whatever help, encouragement, guidance, answers that they need. For others who have already made that decision, I pray that you might use the truth of your word to remind us that we can have a lot of right answers but still have some deficient belief in our hearts that can be replaced by greater belief. And I pray, God, that you might be showing us that we need it. Lord, today we celebrate you, a Savior who came, who lived, who died, who was raised up, never to die again, 
the resurrection, and the life. And it's in the name of Jesus that we say all of this. Amen. Sincerely, thank you for being here today. And this is not normally how we end services or extend invitations, but with all that's going on, let me just say, if we can help you, if I can be of help to you in any way, we will be available to offer whatever guidance that we can. We'll be available here to, at the back. And we we'll hope that you'll just say, hey, let, let me bend your ear for a moment. If you're, again, if you're watching, please just reach out to us. It's so good to see you. Again, as Dan said at the beginning of the service, we're not passing offering plates. If you want to give in person today at each of the three primary exits, there are offering plates that you can place your gift. But it's good to see you. And we're going to dismiss by section. And so I want to, we did one and three last week first. We're going to start with two and four today. And so if you were in two and four.